Welcome to r slash pro revenge. This is a story of someone getting back at someone with pro revenge after being wronged. Thank you friends so much for subscribing, likes, and supporting in the comments. And today's first story is, I see your write up and raise you one corporate message. Let's see who folds first. This all started about a week and a half ago. My husband sent me screenshots of a new policy his district manager put in place. This new policy stated that each employee on shift was required to collect a certain amount of money for their corporate donation campaign from the customers. The donation campaign was collecting money for a major nonprofit organization that his company partnered with every year. If the employee did not collect the designated amount, then the employee would be written up. After he sent me the screenshot, I advised him that his district manager was most likely breaking their company's corporate policies. See, I've worked in the corporate world as a manager, and I have a good understanding how basic policies are established. Therefore, I knew right away she wasn't following policy, or at least didn't believe that the corporate office would be okay with this new policy. He decided to see how it would play out, because all the other staff were complaining and talking about this new policy, and he wasn't ready to stick his neck out on this issue. Well, that all changed a few days later, because out of the six employees who hadn't reached this new policy goal, he was the first one to be given a write-up. Right away, he refused to sign the write-up and advised them to add a note on the write-up, stating he would not sign until he talked to the HR department. After he left the office and while on his lunch break, he decided it was time to address the issues. You see, the new policy stated that each employee would receive a write-up after each shift if they didn't collect the stated amount. So if you started your work week, by the end of that week unless you collected the correct money each shift, you would essentially be fired as the write-ups were the standard first, second, third, and final write-ups that almost all corporate companies follow. Now, the husband could have gone through with the threat of calling the HR department and go through the hassle of dealing with them. But let's be honest. How many times has the HR department actually been any help to the little guy, or as I like to call them, the throwaway staff? So instead of reaching out to them, he went to Facebook and looked up the official donation organization that his company was partnering with, and he left a simple message on their site, asking them if they were okay with his company forcing their employees to collect a certain amount of money each shift for their donation campaign. He even went so far as to let them know that because the staff were not collecting enough money for them, that the employees were being written up and could potentially lose their jobs. He left this message on their Facebook page Sunday night and went back to work and completed his shift. Roll around to Monday afternoon and we're both at work and I get a message from him telling me that he didn't have to worry about his write-up any longer and he would let me know what happened when he got home. In the meantime, I had already looked up all the information for the HR department and was going to be sending them my own email discussing the new policy, but after he told me not to worry, I junked the email I had started and waited to hear his story. We're on our way home after work and he has this huge grin on his face like he ate the canary. While he was at work, the district manager had called in the morning and he happened to be the one to pick up the phone. She was looking for the supervisor on duty and he said she sounded very rushed and frantic. All he could tell her was, the supervisor was out on a work errand and he would have her call back. At this point, he knew something was up because as I mentioned, he sent the message on Sunday night and on Monday, he noticed that someone from the campaign has read his message that morning. Shortly after the phone call, the district manager shows up and asks to meet with them. They go into their meeting. The first thing the manager does is try to backpedal so hard and fast. He thought she was trying out for the Tour de France. She tried to tell him that all the staff and all the managers misunderstood her new policy and that staff would only be written up for not asking the customer if they wanted to donate to the organization, not that the staff had to collect a certain amount of money each shift. Of course, the husband asked if that was the case for this new policy, then why his write-up specifically stated it was because not enough money was collected. She, of course, does what all managers are born or trained to do over time, throw the closest person within reach under the bus. It was of course the supervisor's fault that the write-up was written incorrectly. As they ended the conversation, she threw in the every so much love saying, next time you need to go up the chain of command when you have a concern. After the husband left the office, he checked his phone and received a message back from the donation campaign company. It stated the obvious, their donation campaign is against this type of practice when trying to collect money. However, the best part was where they stated they had called the corporate office my husband works for and spoke with them about this new policy and how they were not okay with this and wanted it changed immediately. So the petty or pro revenge part, you guys can choose which. All the employees have been keeping track of how much money they've collected each day for this donation campaign since the beginning and have a little competition going on for most collected overall. Management is well aware and even encourages this among the staff. While obviously the husband had already been written up previously for not collecting enough money, so he clearly wasn't in the winning circle. After talking to the district manager, he goes back to work and within 24 hours collected enough donation money from his customer because he rocks at customer service that he surpassed everyone else and took the lead in under 24 hours. 
So now the same district manager who just got her A handed to her by her boss's boss gets to go into the staff meeting and congratulate him on collecting the most money for the donation campaign in front of everyone, who by the way has been talking non-stop about her getting in trouble for a new policy. The cat butt face will be strong with that manager come meeting day. The second story is, take all the credit for my work and tell the boss I'm a terrible employee. Well, it was because of me that you got fired. I used to work in a marketing role in a government department. I was part-time and worked along with a girl, who I'll call Karen, who was working on a yearly contract. She'd been there for two years and was very friendly with the department manager and this was the reason her contract kept being renewed. When my manager went on maternity, Karen got temporarily promoted to the management role. This caused a lot of upset in the office as there were a number of more suitable and qualified people who didn't get the chance to act up. As soon as Karen became my manager, everything changed. My workload increased. And as I was part-time, I had to absolutely bust my A to meet project deadlines. All of a sudden, I wasn't being included in staff briefs on new projects, yet was expected to work on them. My department manager was acting really off with me too. This went on for months before I approached my department manager and asked to discuss my workload, etc. She sat me down and basically told me that I really needed to get my act together as Karen was having to pick up my workload and it was affecting her output. Because I was, in Karen's words, so lazy I should be fired. I told the manager what was going on and the actual work I was doing, but she took Karen's side and said I was just assisting with some parts of projects and it was ridiculous of me to claim I was managing and completing so many projects on my own. So I started making mistakes, simple things, adding wrong briefs for designers, not including prices, adding incorrect budgets and deadlines that were two days out, etc. Karen started to get pulled by various managers, asking why she was making so many mistakes, then I knew for sure she was passing off my work as her own. She called me in for a meeting and exploded. I walked out. She had began being about me to teammates, saying how lazy I was, etc. My friends began to tell me what was going on. One friend informed me that Karen was online for an average five hours a day planning her upcoming wedding in Spain and was using the office phones to make international calls to the wedding planners. He could see her screen and couldn't believe how lazy she was. So she was planning her wedding while I was busting my A off. So I decided to skip talking to the managers and went straight to HR. I told them to have IT monitor her internet usage and her outgoing calls. I said I could prove she was a lazy bee and was relying on me. I was obviously able to show email trails and the project documents I had completed and she had then taken and saved down as her own. Two weeks later, Karen was called to HR and told her contract was not being renewed and she was given one month's notice. She told everyone it was because of budget cuts. My department heads brought me in for meetings to apologize and commend me on my excellent work and I got a promotion. I left a couple of months later if they'd believe me in the first place, I wouldn't have endured so many months of stress and anxiety. Update. A lot of people are asking what Karen's motive was. I'm not 100% sure, but what I suspect is this. I was a permanent employee. She was contracted. She knew it was only a matter of time before her role was advertised as a permanent job. In the government, a lot of jobs would be advertised internally, and some would be external. She couldn't apply for the internal jobs, and any of the few external roles that had come up, she'd applied for and hadn't got. The role she had was generic and would have gone out in an internal trawl. I suspect she thought if I got fired or quit, she could get my job. Because of the type of role I held, it would have been advertised externally. She probably thought she could easily get my job. My manager was due back from maternity, so she knew in a few months she'd be back to her regular role and wouldn't have to worry about doing all the work I had been doing for her. That's the most rational explanation I have. And the last story is, yell at us for parking in a reserved space, get arrested and evicted. Disclaimer. Unit 8 was rented by Rick and Tara, not owned. Last winter around January, me, my family and close friends were staying at our condo in Vermont for New Year's to celebrate, ski, etc. My dad owns the 8 unit complex our condo is in and all but one had people up for the holidays. There's a decent amount of area for parking, but when there's a lot of people all there at once, it can get tight. So one night after returning from the mountain, we parked in the spot closest to the stairs to unload everything easier. Our parking lot isn't one with actual spots or anything because it's just gravel and dirt so it's really just eyed out and first come first serve. A few hours later, my brother went to the car to get something from the car, where there was a cardboard sign left on the car. The sign read, Reserve Parking for Unit 8, handicapped on both sides. And yes, they forgot the in and handicapped on both sides as well. Like I said, there's no specific spots for anyone. Unit 8 was one of the smaller units on the ground level, about half the size of the rest. The couple that rented there was sketchy to say the least. They had to be in their mid-twenties, but we never saw them much and didn't know too much about them. Let's just call them Rick and Tara. Another 20 minutes later and I go down to the car to get some forgotten gloves. As I unlock the car, the lights alert them someone's at the car and through the window Rick starts yelling at me, telling me I have to move the car by the morning or they'd have it towed. 
At this point, I can also realize that Rick is off of something, so I subsequently ignore him, grab my things, and head back up. I get into the condo and explain to my dad the experience I just had with Rick. At this point, he's had enough and decided he was going to go down there himself to handle things himself. So he goes down there to talk to him. My dad was really the only person that had met them before, but it was briefly during the leasing of their unit. He knocks on the door, and it's about 30 seconds until Rick angrily answers the door. He crankily asks, what do you want? My dad politely explains that no spots are reserved, and that it's first come first serve. Rick instantly starts freaking out, saying that it's a handicapped spot, and that they're going to call the landlord. They had little experience with my dad when they leased the place about a year before, and in that time he was diagnosed with cancer and lost a lot of weight. With that, his appearance changed drastically. Rick didn't realize he was speaking to the landlord and kept his rant going. As my dad was going to lay it out for him, he noticed on a table in the living area that there was a pipe of sorts. Paired with the behavior and appearance of Rick at the time, my dad concluded it was a pipe of sorts for drugs. He backpedaled out of the conversation and returned back up to our condo. When he got back in, he called the cops, explaining the situation and what he saw. 30 minutes later, cops pull up and start talking to Rick. Going off what my dad told them about the pipe, one of the cops noticed it, but this time out in the open with a bag next to it. At that point, it was revealed that they were smoking crack, and they were both arrested. Along with that, my dad also evicted them from the property, for violating terms, obviously. We ended up renovating the whole place afterwards, because who knows how long they'd been smoking that inside. The upside is that the cardboard sign still hangs in the living room, and gives us a laugh each time we pass. Don't forget to subscribe if you enjoyed the video. Thank you friends for watching to the end.